Charles, first of all, is just a delightful man. I've been very privileged to make his acquaintance with this. And besides being the principal investigator of Space Watch in Arizona, he is also their inspiration. He's a professor of planetary sciences at the University of Arizona. He's a Sabharabai professor of the Physics Research Laboratory in India, and I will allow him to give the correct pronunciation. In 1994, he edited this publication, The Hazards of Comets and Asteroids. And just, I'm not going to go through the whole list because I promised him a very brief introduction. Just in this year alone, he had an article in the Scientific American of March. He was included in an article in the uh, Final Frontier, the March-April issue. And since I promised him a short introduction, I'll do that, and I'll merely recommend that you read his autobiography on the glassy sea and astronomer's journey. I was delighted by it, and I'm sure you will too. I'm very pleased to present Tom Gerald of Space Force. Thank you. So let me first state some uh, reasons why we want to study comets and asteroids. There is a strong reason which I will show a little bit later when we come to the slides of the role that the comets and the asteroids played in the origin of the solar system, the building up of the planets. The Earth is formed from the clumping together of comets and asteroids. One of the latest ideas, that's in fact the second chapter in the Hazards uh, book, is that the oceans of the Earth came from cometary impact, cometary contribution to the formation of the Earth. The second reason is on the evolutions that has already been mentioned today, and you all know about that, that 65 million years ago, there was a major impact that affected the evolutions of life on Earth, and there may have been other ones like that. What happened 65 million years ago, of course, was the elimination of the dinosaurs, by which our forefathers and mothers had a better chance of developing into the present uh, life as we know it. The third reason is connected with that, that space is not entirely empty yet, uh, or as a matter of fact, got filled in back again from collisions in the asteroid belt. In the asteroid belt, the orbits are stable. They're very large objects. It's fortunate that these objects cannot get to the Earth and in stable circular orbit. And it's very fortunate that that is so because the largest of the asteroids in the asteroid belt are as large as 1,000 kilometers in diameter. If any one of those would ever hit the Earth, there would be totally no chance of even recovery of life on Earth. And the interesting part to answer already now one of the questions that had been asked earlier today is the largest of the near Earth asteroids is about 10 kilometers in size. I will show you a uh, table of these uh, sizes. And that by itself is a very fundamental observation. We do not get any larger pieces than about 10 kilometers to the Earth. That by itself is an indication that we're dealing with fragments. So in the asteroid belt, even though these orbits are stable, there are so many of these asteroids that they collide, that they have fragments then that fly in all directions, and then under the action of Jupiter's differential gravitation, one gets the decircularization instead of perfect circular orbits and stability in the asteroid belt, or nearly perfect circular orbits. One gets highly elliptical orbits, and thereby can cross uh, the orbits of Mars, the Earth-Moon system, Venus, and even Mercury, or even some of these things can be probably right into the sun. Then there's the exploration, which of course is so exciting. Uh, it's a bit neglected uh, now. NASA, in its ultimate uh, wisdom, uh, opened about six years ago six centers for the uh, uh, search, that is the, the search and exploration and preparation for exploration. 
not just one or two, but six. And I thought at the time, boy, that is a tremendous step forward in this exploration part. Unfortunately, due to pressure from the Congress, I think uh, these centers were all eliminated about a year and a half ago, and not just that one or two were left uh, all, uh, in operation, no, all of them were eliminated uh, then. But I'm sure that that will be picked up again and that we will have a new year coming. And always this uh, sort of a cycle from bad to good again, provided we cause that cycle to happen, that we ask for these operations, not just sit like dodos, but actually work for it and, and demand it, then it will happen and we'll get the exploration uh, back. Uh, as in fact, you see some of the preparations for that, uh, like Bob Farquhar uh, showed with the near mission and other missions too, like Clement Guide and the two. Then finally, it's a challenge to find these objects. As an astronomer at the telescope, this is a lot more fun to ob observe these objects than it is to observe stars and galaxies. These things move, they're fugitive, they're elusive objects, you have to find them, and not only that, you have to follow up on them and, and, and stay with them. So that's a very exciting uh, business at the telescope to do that. So some time ago, we formed a, a space watch uh, group at the University of Arizona. It was uh, based on the ultimate goal to get magnitude frequency relations, not just for near-Earth asteroids, for all populations of small bodies in the solar system. It was based on old work at the European McDonald's survey, the Palmer Alignment survey, then a space watch 0.9 meter telescope, and we're just about finishing up the complete a 1.8 meter space watch uh, telescope. We have observers. Uh, there is category of point. There are three observers because we have 18 nights, and each one of these observers uh, observes them uh, six nights. And I thought, there you can see it right there. So we have three observers. Observer there, an observer here, and each one observes six nights per month, and therefore we cover 18 nights per month. And we have other people like the most important per person, Bob McMillan, the manager. We have a research associate. We have people for engineering and, and optics, and then we have these students. Now that's the part that, that has been changed. This morning we talked a little bit about changes and, and, and to adapt to changes. I have a wonderful monitor at the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, uh, Dr. Henry Rodosky. And one time when I came on my yearly trip back from India, and of course with jet lag, the trip even to the East Coast would take maybe 30 hours from the city of Ahmedabad, and I got into his office and I slumped in his big chair, and he looks at me and he says, you don't look so good. You better reproduce yourself because I've invested a lot of money into your project and you don't want that to get lost. Well, thank you, Henry, that's quite a hint. Uh, what shall I do? We have to get students. And the original old fashioned approach was that in a project like this, I didn't want any students. And I said that to Henry, I said, they're a nuisance. I have to babysit them and they're not very productive and I have to get the work done. And anyhow, he then encouraged not only that with his words, but also with money. He said, I'll pay for it, and he got these students. And it has actually become a great success. More of these students, we actually have three more already now, and additional ones want to come in and they work very well. We have, of course, a telescope designer, and then we have 140. Actually, this is an old view graph. The number presently stands at 161 sponsors. These are private and corporate donors that help to support this uh, project. The finances, for instance, of the uh, big uh, telescope, the 1.8 meter telescope, comes from four nearly equal uh, kinds of supporters. There is the Clementine program, there is the uh, NASA and the University of Arizona, and then these private and corporate uh, donors. And that is going on with great delight, and I'm encouraging that very much. If any one of you want to become a part of this, please do so. We uh, consider that a great, a great uh, contribution from people, actually, for whom we work in a way to protect them from these horrors of such an impact. So that is going on uh, well. 
and we get uh, results. The uh, finding of these objects and identification is uh, largely done by the uh, rates. Uh, you get somewhat of a similar uh, the idea that if you think of an airplane in the distance, its angular rate is very low. That same airplane at the same linear speed coming overhead, its angular rate is very high. So there is a correlation, if you observe in the right part of the sky, between the speed of the object and, um, and, and its distance, and thereby the identification of the type of an object it is. Actually, this plot is a miracle if the solar system were a discus, actually a disk, a solid disk rotating, you would never get such a plot. The rates then are in the ecliptic, in the plane of the ecliptic in the abscissa and perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic in the uh, ordinary. And why are they negative numbers? Well, you have to imagine that for a moment, how that is, that is the Earth motion is actually angle the greatest, and therefore, just like if you move your head right now and look at my head, if you move your head sideways, you move my head, then I go in the opposite direction. And that is what happens here also. So we see then uh, prograde positive ones, it could be fast trails anytime, but certainly these are objects that are very close to the Earth. Slow motions are very distant objects, like close to Neptune would be here, the centaurs are in the outer part of the solar system, we are finding those. Then there are the Trojans of Jupiter, and then you get the various populations in the main belt of the asteroids. And you can actually see from these plots, these are actually observations made of these rates, that you can recognize these so-called Kirkwood gaps in the main belt of asteroids. And anything to the left of this is a near-Earth asteroid. And that's how we find them. And then also we determine orbits, proximate orbits for these objects. And we got statistics on a large scale now, thousands of objects uh, in the main belt. The main belt of the asteroids, easy to remember, is uh, the sun would be somewhere over here at zero, the Earth at one astronomical unit for the semi-major axis of the orbit. And the main belt lies approximately between 2.2 and 3.3 astronomical units. And then this is a plot that is made in the ordinary is given a, 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 a the sign angle, actually, the sign of the inclination. And that way you get the characteristics of the orbit, and you get all these orbital parameters that even certain families, like the EOS family, can be recognized here. When you take the relative distribution, the sum of these, you get a certain a uh, diagram here that reflects the resonances. The resonances of Jupiter are the most important ones. There is a very complex one, like the new six resonance, but there are the very well-known ones, for instance, here at 2.5, where you get a, a, a gap there in the distribution. That means that for the time of two revolutions of Jupiter about the Sun, there are five of these revolutions at exactly that same time of the asteroid at that distance of 2.9 astronomical unit from the Sun. So then we study these orbits and get magnitude uh, frequency relations, which is the original goal of this uh, work. We find plenty of these objects. Uh, on a good clear night, we find 300 of them or so. And they're all new ones uh, because this goes rather faint. This goes to the 21st astronomical magnitude with the 36 inch the old telescope. And that magnitude will be greatly improved with the new 1.8 meter telescope. What we're after for these statistics in the main belt of the asteroids is where did this come from? It is an idea that, uh, and this now is in sizes, it is in an absolute magnitude, but it can give you sort of the sizes in, in that is the logarithmic scale, that uh, the largest of the asteroids would be here, and that then is a very large in proportion of 1,000 kilometers, but about 200 kilometers is in here in diameter, and we get down to about one kilometer uh, in about this uh, range. And the numbers then are given in the ordinate. And the idea is that we sort of suspect that we'd like to confirm this from these magnitude frequency relations. That's one of the beauties of this type of work, that there was an original formation in that part of the solar system. 
or for moments. Let us cooperate together on these small pieces, the comets and the asteroids, and then, so you do get in a regular distribution, as you know, Mercury and Venus and the Earth-Moon system and, and Mars, and then there's a gap, and you get Jupiter and the other outer planets. But in between that gap then, there was no formation of a planet because there was a differential the gravity of Jupiter spoiling it every time. Every time the two of these pieces would go to get together, they were disrupted, they were pulled apart, you could not coagulate because of the very massive planet Jupiter that was coming by regularly, like you saw in those resonances. But that then was in the asteroid belt as a formation of a certain category of objects. Objects on the average maybe 100 kilometers in, in diameter. Some larger, all the way up to 1,000 kilometers, and some smaller down to maybe 10 kilometers. And that, that was the original distribution right here. But then over the time, the lifetime of the solar system, we got all these collisions. We know that these collisions take place. And that you then get fragments. Not all these fragments would come to Earth, but some of these fragments would stay in the main belt. And that you would thereby get a large number here on such a tail of these fragments. That if you put that together, there's the original distribution plus a fragment distribution that you would get something that we presently could observe, something like this with the hump in there. And that's what we're after to, to document that idea, to, to make that more precise and, and get it based on better data and we're beginning, just beginning to discover that. The first results, uh, oddly enough, ended up in that Scientific American article. These editors are very good to smoke out of some of our new results and a little bit nilly nilly on my part, but that magnitude frequency distribution is actually in Scientific American of the March 1996 uh, issue. Now about the hazard. I'd like to talk about the beauty of comets and asteroids. And, and that even the hazards, although the hazards are real, the beauty of that is that we're on our way to take care of it. The way I like to summarize the hazard is the give you some of the numbers. And I invite you to memorize for yourself the middle line, because the middle line is the most important one. Anything above there, we believe, will cause a global disaster. So it is the size of about one kilometer. We've been debating that a little bit. Is it really one kilometer that causes a global disaster? By global disaster, I mean that the energy is so large that the Earth's atmosphere is totally disturbed and that the effects become globally noticed in a very short order and thereby eliminate at least society the way we know it today and perhaps even more seriously with a lot of loss of life. There are about a thousand of these objects, if you want to be more precise. We right now think it's 1,700 of them, but it's very uncertain. Plus minus 500, that number is established. So it could be 1,200, it could be 2,200. The chance of that is uh, once in a million years. So once in a million years, we get nicked by one of these objects. If you want to do it a little more precisely, it is actually 300,000 years. But then again, of course, it's very uncertain. The uh, chance now, you would say, is so negligible, I'm not going to worry about this. This is one of the most difficult aspects to tell people about this. But I have full appreciation of it myself, because this figure here, I have myself been showing since 1977. And it's only about three or four years ago that I began to realize the horror of this situation what really happened 65 million years ago. And that occurred in the editing of this book then. This book, if you want information about the hazards, it should be pretty well up here in this book, at least the status of it a year or two ago. All of these aspects are studied by teams, not individual papers. There are about 120 authors in there, 46 chapters that deal with the various aspects of the hazards from finding them, identifying them, their compositions too. There were a lot of questions already today. What happens if you have a fragile object, a rubble pile? How can you detect that? That is uh, studied in that. Should these discoveries be made from space or from the Earth? That is studied in this uh, book. 
how best to study what angle and how to also deflect them and how to mitigate danger. The second half of the book is mostly written by engineers and nuclear uh, people and who are familiar with that type of calculation. But uh, the, the, the point and coming back is how can you tell people about this hazard? And I have a full appreciation for it that people, if you tell them first about this, they will say, oh, come now. We have enough troubles already on Earth, and here is this guy who probably wants some money. And uh, the, that was the accusation in the Washington Post very strongly, but now it is sort of gone because we've been writing letters to the editor of the Washington Post and, and saying we were wrong on this. But there was this idea that the nuclear engineers also were running out of work because of the end of the Cold War, and now they were uh, locking in on this asteroid problem just to get more work done. Well, that isn't true at all because they already in 1981, at the height of the Cold War, we invited the nuclear engineers in on this problem. And these slides also, and, and, and the probabilities in that we have known for a very long time. Not only just slides in 1977, but there are people like the astronomer Ernst Kupik and, and Harold Urey and people like this who have been writing about this problem way much earlier than the early 70s already. It is a low probability. I can give you one other number in addition to these numbers, which are easy to remember. I, I remind you again, one kilometer, there are about a thousand of them. The chance is once in a million years. But the energy is a million times the energy used in Hiroshima. And that by itself, I believe, you don't need any training in nuclear warfare to have some feeling of it. But if you have an energy that is comparable to a million times the energy used at Hiroshima in 1945, then something very drastically will go wrong with the Earth's atmosphere. There is no uncertainty or very little uncertainty about that number. You give it to undergraduate students to compute the kinetic energy of an impact is, as you all know, half times the mass times the square of the velocity. The volume of the object you know because they give you one kilometer, the density, you can assume that of meteorites, about three grams per cubic centimeter. And then, uh, so that gives you the mass of the object of about a kilometer uh, asteroid. And then there is the velocity, which is the relative velocity between the circular orbit of the Earth and the elliptical orbit of the asteroid, the near-Earth asteroid, the, the fragment that came from the asteroid belt at its greater distance. It's in the asteroid belt at its minimum distance, it is uh, less than one astronomical unit well inside the Earth's orbit. And that differential velocity is on the order of 20 kilometers per second. So it's 20 kilometers per second that is right across this great city here within a second. And that is squared, and that's where you get the great energy from of uh, a million times the energy used at the ocean. I can give you one other number which is, is a little bit more precise than that uh, once in a million. And that is a number that is also easy to remember, but a little bit more refined of this. The chance of a globally damaging collision, that's a one kilometer asteroid, in a lifetime, so that is 60, 70 years, is about once, one in 5,000. That's a large number, of course. You can say, well, I'm going to ignore that. But you better not because of these high energies that are involved. On the other hand, you can also recognize that it is not zero. The one in 5,000 is an appreciable uh, chance. You have to do something, take care of this. And astronomically, and as scientists in general, I think it is a, an, an inexcusable uncertainty. There are about 1,700 of these objects out there, and one of them might have it, our name on it, and we don't know it. There's something, there's an uncertainty, there's a lack of knowledge there, which is totally inexcusable. Any person who wants to not worry about this, I think he suffers from what I call dinosauritis. So we have to do this, and we are doing this. Here are telescope systems that are working particularly on this hazard aspect. In the first place, there was a small Schmidt telescope 
And palm language was used, and then they stopped doing it because uh, this was done photographically. And they stopped it in 1994. And this year, that uh, Shoemaker and Yves Lavigne are maybe going back again to this palm uh, photographic telescope for the very simple uh, emotional reason that it was so much fun to do it and so exciting that they miss it greatly in their present life. And that therefore, they're going back to palm to do some more intuitive there. Then there is this space watch system that started in 1990 and is going along well. Then uh, this slide is a bit old. I uh, listed first uh, the ones that are in operation. You see at the Anglo Australian Observatory in Siding Spring, Australia is working, and amateurs too are coming online, particularly in Japan. The telescopes as large as one meter made by themselves and the CCD on it, and they're finding a few asteroids. But I had expected the one at the Côte d'Azur in southern France to come online first, then the one at the Lowe Observatory, then the one at APL, and then the Space Watch 1.8 meter. Well, much to everybody's surprise, this system right here, that is called NEAT, actually came online first. It came online two months ago, and it is working right now uh, quite well. What would I think is the next one? Well, I'll demo on it, but still the Frenchman will have it online sometime also in 1996. Uh, I believe that the anglo Australians with their electronic system will also come online somewhere in 1996, perhaps 1997. And finally, the Lowe Observatory also will come in online in 1997, as will the 1.8 meter uh, space watch uh, telescope. That, that telescope is shown in uh, this um, figure here. This is the drone man that is actually now about to be built. The contract is uh, let uh, for it. And by the uh, fall of this year, the telescope will come together with its uh, building. How many minutes have I done? I have another 10 minutes ago. Good. Then I will now go to the slides. If someone please be willing to turn on that machine. system also were formed. Those interstellar grains are fascinating objects. They're highly complex uh, of different compositions in various parts of their, like at the center here, is indicated the silicate core and even organic materials in their temple. As the, as the grain coagulates from the molecules in space, you get even on the outside sometimes for the larger ones, uh, a really organic, uh, photolyzed uh, uh, compositions, highly complex molecules, and uh, detailed structures of the interstellar grains. Life really came from these interstellar grains from space. They usually don't come by themselves, but then they coagulate in turn and make larger objects. The bar indicates one micro. This is an interstellar particle, we believe, that has been picked up. Uh, there is that picking up going up from high altitude balloons and U2 aircraft. The next phase of coagulation is in terms of an asteroid. This is an asteroid 
that it actually like what we think of to sort of produce rubble fire. Different from comet. Well, first let me finish on the asteroids. The iron in the asteroid belt, as I have mentioned to you, you got the Venus graph, you got the orbits of Mercury, uh, Mar uh, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then you get this gap to Jupiter, and there is where the asteroids are with these stable, nearly circular uh, orbits. Comets are objects that have that are not dead, that are not coagulated close enough to the heat of the sun, but in outer parts of the solar system, where it was cold, so that the the, the gases and the snows and the ices and so could be among the material. And when an object like that does get heated up because its orbit is decircularized and it gets into an elliptical orbit and it gets close to the sun. Then because of that heating, these materials, these volatiles, will come out and will will be expanding and forcing themselves out like in a jet action, like a volcano, and you see them, these pieces coming out, uh, dust pieces coming out with the gases. There's even a picture of it, which I think is an astonishing picture. It's not a real picture taken. It's an artist who worked on the data uh, on the space uh, flights of some uh, years ago. But this is the image, which I believe is correct, of a cometary core. You can see all this activity now very different from a, uh, an asteroid of material without uh, follicles. And then, of course, you see the beautiful tails of the comet. And here is a picture now of the uh, space port, 0.9 meter telescope. That is the one that is open here, that one there, is the 36 inch space port telescope. And the 1.8 will be built here in an equally tall uh, tower. Right there, we'll have these two space port telescopes uh, together on 15. This is the uh, picture of the telescope, and this is a picture made at night. A real exposure, actually. Uh, you can tell from the duration of it, there's a trailing star right there. So the telescope is actually tracking of the stars. Uh, well, uh, the photographer, James Scotty, had a, a low uh, light uh, level uh, lamp on here to take this uh, picture of space source actually at uh, work. One of the ways to detect the fast moving asteroid that was in that great diagram on the right, where the object is so close to the Earth that it moves so fast in the exposure time on this charged couple device, which is about two and a half minutes, that it shows a, a trail. This is an old classical way of finding them. We've actually much more sophisticated ways of finding them also of the very slow moving and yet near the asteroids or the very slow moving objects in the outer part of the solar system. So this is another sophisticated business. Now I have a few uh, pictures here to help you with the realization of the hazard. I, I said for a moment, you, you come to people and, and I sympathize with them and they say to me, oh, I don't believe this. Here you guys are going to money and you want a job and that's why you talk about this hazard. So it's not for real. And, and come on now because it's a beautiful day and don't tell me about some other problem. We have enough problems on the earth already. And then they say sometimes, uh, uh, We've never heard of anybody being hit by an asteroid. But it is not quite true. There are various warnings, and this, these happen all the time. This happened in 1976 in the town, uh, actually a village of Tajana, close to the town of Ahmedabad in India. And at night, there was a big explosion, and the headmaster of that school, it's a very isolated village, was a very bright man. He realized what had happened, that it was a meteorite that probably had broken up and that the pieces would be lying in this desert. And he went on his bike to the city of Ahmedabad and found one of the meteoritists there in the physical research laboratory. And then they went back to the town and took a day off from school. And the children in their school uniform were put on line, as you see here, to find the pieces of the meteorite and they found it. And I'd love to show this picture here. It's utterly light. This little girl has found a piece, and she's bringing that. In fact, this was taken by the scientists 
of the physical research laboratory. I kind of felt teasing you also for just hanging from her nose, if not a booger, but a golden ring. This is another case which happened in 1954 in a small town in Alabama where this woman was resting uh, on her sofa and she was hit by a meteorite which had come through her roof and through her ceiling and hit her right there in her living room. The fun story about this one is that she wanted, after she was cured here by the doctor of this horrible wound here, she wanted to meteorite as a souvenir. But she was living in a rented house. And the owner said, no, I want a meteorite, I'm going to sell it, because after all, I have the roof to repair and the ceiling to repair the living room. So that became a court case. The moment it became, a judge became involved, and he had to report that this was coming up for a decision that surely he was going to make. The state of Alabama actually got involved. And that presentation to the judge was that this is obviously an act of God, that the highest authority to represent God would be the state, and that the state, after all, would do something good with the meteorite, maybe put it in a museum so that all of the people could see it. Now, I ask you for a moment to be the judge and decide to whom would you give it and why. And uh, since we don't have all that much time, I'll tell you the solution now. The judge ruled that the meteorite would be given to the woman because she had the most intimate familiarity with it. <laughs> the next one up in size is this, of course, the meteor. And that's a misnomer, meteor crater. Somebody asked here about uh, different sizes and so forth. What we have as standards is that the little shooting star we call a meteor. The thing that you can hold in your hand or maybe up to a meter or so, we call a meteorite. And beyond there, it is an asteroid or it could be a comet. And it's just a matter of, of kind of uh, habit, custom. But anyhow, this is not a meteor. It would be a tiny little pebble that burns up in the Earth's atmosphere, so this should be called the meteor crater, but that's what it's called, it is in northern Arizona. That's an object of about 60 meters in size that hit there probably about 40, 50,000 years ago and made this crater which has a diameter of 1.2 kilometers. Next, of course, and I will end with that one, is what happened uh, in uh, Mexico. You should see this one first. It is on that peninsula where this crater has been identified. The crater is not seen. When you fly over it, you do not see the crater. It has a diameter of about 180 kilometers. The derived size of the object, <coughs> not derived from this crater size, it's all the opposite way, but from various other uh, debris that has been found in various parts of the world is believed that the asteroid was about 12 kilometers in diameter, one of the largest of the near-Earth asteroids. But here's this crater, it's all covered up with uh, slip. It's now being recognized from some infrared uh, work from space, and it is really believed to be underneath there, and that is documented with some drilling that had been done actually long before that already by some oil companies uh, there in, um, in uh, Mexico. And with that, I'm going to close and see if you have any questions that we can uh, discuss further. Yes, sir. His question is whether there are any objects that have been identified to come from outer space, uh, not uh, from uh, either the asteroid belt or from the Oort bar, which is at large distances. These are the comets then that are indeed at very great uh, distance uh, from the Earth. But it's a well-defined cloud of sorts with uh, the spherical cloud around the Earth at great distances, 30,000 to about 100,000 astronomical units. That's where this cloud is huge reservoirs that 10 to the 13 or so comets are believed to be there in this outer profile. Any object that's your question that came from beyond there, from the stars? And the answer is no. Or put it in another way, no uh, hyperbolic orbit has as yet been uh, recognized about any of the objects coming in.
So the question is, uh, what are the sizes that get through to the Earth's atmosphere? This question is more elegantly posed, but that is the way I will try to, uh, to answer it. A large asteroid, like um, uh, the limit size that you are looking for, uh, larger than about uh, 50 meters in diameter, will go through the Earth's atmosphere, regardless of the composition. Lower, smaller than 60 meters or so in diameter, we do get a differentiation. And it's quite clear by the time that you get to 10 meters or so in diameter, the only the metallic ones will get through. And these are about 4% of all the asteroids. Only 4% of them will get through when they're that small. Shoemaker and his wife, in addition to being observers and really astronomers, at uh, Palomar there with the small uh, Schmidt telescope. They go in other parts of the year uh, to identify craters in the Australian shield, that is in the northwestern part of Australia. And they identify these small craters, and the ratio is about 15. So you have uh, a 10 meter object, and you're looking for a 150 meter crater, and they find the pieces of metal around these craters invariably. So these small craters are always due to metallic objects. So it's the metallic objects only that get through. The others uh, make uh, air bursts in the upper atmosphere. And that is what happened in Tunguska in 1908. With an object about 60 meters that didn't get through, it uh, made an enormous air blast in the upper atmosphere that was heard as far away as London, but there was no crater. There is no crater. Uh, one question, in regards to airbursts and other things that produce a substantial amount of dust in the atmosphere, um, some indication uh, recently by the Lewis's and a few other places, uh, I know that dust in the atmosphere alone may be a real problem. And uh, that, I believe one of my gentlemen has uh, published a small piece recently that the ice ages would literally be triggered by much dust coming in, whether it's something that would actually go smack on the surface or not. Yeah. What, what sorts of volumes uh, are we talking about, and are we, are we talking uh, about any real frequency uh, of that happening that is anything related to like what we're experiencing recently? Yeah, so we also know about the uh, dust in the upper atmosphere. And quite a bit of that is treated by some of the authors here in this, uh, in this book. Uh, the, the worst case, of course, was that what happened 65 million years ago. The, the amount of dust was enormous. It was partly from the object itself, which settled down all over the world and has been recognized in uh, anomalous abundance of iridium and other metals. That is, none uh, Earth's surface but really had come from space. That's why it was identified in 1980. Uh, and that caused a, a, a blackening out of the, of the sun for maybe half a year. So that was an enormous amount. But that's not what your question is after. Your question is more after the smaller ones and leaving enough uh, dust to cause such obscuration that you would get an, an ice age. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. I would just, from the sound of it, I would say, no, that, that, that does not seem very likely that even the big one of 65 million years ago caused, after all, a blackening of uh, half a year only, and that would probably not be enough of an effect, seems to me, to cause an, uh, an enormous effect like an ice age. It looks more like there are sort of chaotic effects in the Earth's atmosphere that cause these uh, ice ages. But again, I'm not an expert on this. The signal that can be something spread down again and again and again and again and again and again and again Yes, I suppose so. You would really get a burst of, of many of these objects uh, to come in. But there is no evidence of that. There is the only evidence that we do have. And uh, in fact, uh, Jay Gawash uh, of the uh, University of Arizona has worked on that that there is about 15% or so of all the impacts of the near-Earth asteroids are doubles. And you can see that very nicely if you ever have a chance to stop off and I recommend this at the Frankfurt Airport. You ever get to the Frankfurt Airport, rent one of the fast cars, about 
220 kilometers southeast of the Frankfurt airport, we have two of these craters. The main one is called Ries, R-I-E-S, and the other one is at Steinheim, which must have been the satellite of the original uh, asteroid. They impacted together. About change, there is some evidence of some change, but not a huge numbers as you are referring to. I'll be here next. I'm coming. depending on their sizes. I think that's the essence of your, of your question. And indeed, the one that uh, happened 65 million years ago is very rare. In this uh, table that I showed you, you could see that. As you go from 1,000 objects at one kilometer size, the factor is 100 by the time that you go a factor of 10 in size. So there are only 10 or so. You probably know all of them of the very uh, largest ones. The ones the one of 65 million years ago was exceptionally large, 12 kilometers. And it also hit in very exceptionally bad uh, terrain. Uh, that had been a rainforest some 300, um, 300 million years before, and there was a lot of CO2 deposit which was brought up by the impact, and therefore would probably killed the dinosaur. This had been debated for a long time by the paleontologists who pointed out that it took a long time for dinosaurs to die. They didn't die in a year or so or in 10 years. It took them hundreds of thousands of years to be eliminated. That probably was caused by a global warming, which has been modeled by Smith and co-authors in this book uh, that the uh, thermal uh, uh, warming, global warming, was as much as 15 degrees centigrade uh, at that time due to the liberation of the CO2 and other um, um, materials that got into the Earth's atmosphere that shielded, like greenhouse, the radiation from the Earth and actually made it into a very hot greenhouse. That kind of mechanism that we have for our global warming uh, has its uh, also, but we are talking about a few degrees, and at that time it may be 15 degrees and for hundreds of years. Next question over there. How does the impact how does the impact angle affect how dangerous the explosion? Yeah. The impact angle, the impression I have, again I'm not an expert on this, is a matter sum uh, when you're dealing with small objects. Like at the uh, Arizona crater, the Mitchell crater. There is some, a good indication of a Dean Shoemaker's uh, PhD dissertation on that, that the object, I believe, came from the northeast, and therefore in the southwest there is a sort of an extra upbuilding on the uh, crater rim. I have the, on the other hand, the overall impression that if you're dealing with a, a big object of 10 kilometers or so, that it doesn't make any difference at all. You just get a huge crater and you get the uh, effects of the, of the tremendous energy that is predominant over any uh, small effects uh, depending on the angle of the impact. It's just an impression. I don't know that anybody has really done some uh, serious uh, work on that. I'll leave your next one. Yes, sir. Um, sure. is about an impact in Italy, which is to be examined uh, shortly, and I know nothing about this. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, there are, of course, uh, more indications 
generations, more and more indications of impacts and craters that have been slipped over by erosion on the earth or by plate tectonics on the earth, but people are finding and, and big questions are asked if that is the thing really an impact crater uh, or, or, or not. From the fact you're standing, I guess we have one more question. Who wants to do it? So his question is, does the ocean make any difference? And I have the impression that uh, uh, for the large ones, it makes no difference at all. And that you can sort of derive yourself. If you have a speed of 20 kilometers per second, and suppose the thing comes in fairly perpendicular, the scale height of the Earth's atmosphere is 8 kilometers. So you have about a third of a second or so to go through the Earth's atmosphere, or in fact, to go through the ocean. And, and therefore, it makes no difference for the large ones whether the ocean is present or not. On the other hand, for the little ones, like I did, it was referred to earlier today, that if you're dealing with a, say, a 10 meter object, that would be a metallic object in the ocean or on the land, the effects could be totally different. And that is one of them that came out actually at the meeting that we held for this book. It was a big meeting with people from all over the world present, and the word tsunamis came up. In fact, Edward Teller got terribly excited about this. He had never thought about tsunamis, and he started writing a paper right there at the, at the meeting. He was a very brilliant person. But the effect of the tsunamis can be horrendous uh, and, and probably play the greatest uh, role for the, for the smaller uh, impacts. 